it's uh, it's horrible. It was horrible. But you described it before as being an epiphany of uh, no longer fearing death. And well, that was true, to... because I really did think I was dying. I really did. I mean, nothing, I choose coming out of everywhere. You know, for those that don't know what meningitis is, it, the lining of the brain, the, 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 the surrounding of the brain swells up, and it's crushing the brain. Um, so, needless to say, your nervous system uh, starts to do some very funny things. <laughs> Uh, so I had tubes coming out of everywhere. I was in incredible pain, unbelievable pain. Even with the drugs they were giving me, it didn't, you know, I don't know what I had, but whatever it was, it wasn't working. And I was, I, I was phoning a few friends up to say goodbye. You know, I said, I don't think I'm gonna come out of this, because I was getting worse and worse. And they didn't, they thought I might have leukemia, they thought I might have TB. Um, they were doing tests for everything, they couldn't find what it was. And, uh, but then I just, I, for some reason, I, they must have given me some, a better drug. <laughs> uh, but I don't know why, but I just started to think back through my life, and it was like, there was no lights at the end of tunnels, there were no lights in the sky, there was none of that. But I thought about my life, and it was, I thought, can you ever believe you've done what you've done for us? You know, you're, the, you're this yacht from Shepherd's Bush, you got slung out of school, and you, you know, you've met queens and princes and, you know, presidents, you've been in the White House, you've been in, you know, everything. Can you ever, could you ever believe you would have done this for, for your life? And I, I thought, well, it's all right, actually, isn't it? You know, things aren't as bad as I think they are. And I also, then I started thinking about my family, and I thought, I don't leave anyone in trouble. I don't leave anyone. They'll all be all right. If I go, there's nothing wrong with what, what? What's going on with me now is that I'm fighting to hang on. And I, and I used to have a therapist way back in the, in, in, on the 89 tour, because I from a certain injuries I had my, earlier on in my career. I need to have a lot of physio on the road. And um, she used to say to me, hanging on is hard. Once you let go, it's easy. And, she, and that came to me and I thought, I'm gonna let go. And when I let go, it was just wonderful, incredible peace came over me. And I'll never forget that. And it, there were no lights, there were no lights or any of that. I didn't have that kind of epiphany. But I did feel incredibly peaceful. It was like being wrapped in cotton wool. And I was still in pain, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And then within a few months, you were back on the road. Well, I wasn't a few months, mate. It was six, five months, wasn't it? It was a few. People are waving. I was good at falling over, though. I'm getting waved at, so oh, I'm yes. going to... <laughs> <laughs> um, how, a final question from me. How... Uh, how long are you and Pete and the band going to be carrying on? Um, Indefinitely, into your 90s. No, I, I, I mean, I think Pete feels the same way. I'd like to do it because I think we, we play his music better than anyone. Uh, and all the time, yeah. And all the time we can do that well and not cheat it. If I ever think I, you know, I did have a few years there where my voice, I had a precancerous con condition on my throat where my voice wasn't good and I thought I was going to have to st stop. But since then I've kind of cured the problem and I take care of it now and uh, uh, um, we I'm going to go on doing it as long as I can still do it and not cheat it. If I ever come off and think, you can't do this anymore, Rog, if I ever get that thought go through my head, that will be it, I'll walk away from it because I don't want to cheat you. I'm going to ask, I've got one question that was sent in, and this is what we, unfortunately, we're going to have to finish with. Deb Trombley, if you're in the audience, sing your favourite Who li lyric out loud. And you're not in the audience, big surprise. Uh, did you ever... It's bogus then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> did you ever hit anyone or yourself with the flying microphone? I hit myself all the time with it. Uh, and I only ever hit one person with it, and that was deliberately. Uh, 
And that was a that was a, that was a teddy boy who was down the front at the Albert Hall in 1969 when we were playing opposite the Stones in the park. They were in the park. We were in the Albert Hall and we were playing with Chuck Berry. And, and, and Chuck Berry was a difficult character. Uh, we were supposed to be headlining and he was the support act. But he, uh, when we first went into the Albert Hall, he said, I don't agree with this. He said, um, I want to headline one of the shows. We don't care, Chuck. We love Chuck. You know, so we tossed a coin and we supported Chuck in the first show. We used to do two shows in those days. And in the second show, Chuck had to support us. Chuck's audience was very different from the kind of <laughs> the soon to be hippies <laughs> of the Who audience. They were teddy boys. Um, 50s teddy boys, you know, with the sideburns and the drape jackets and everything else. Anyway, they took umbrage to these long-haired people playing this rock opera to them and started to uh, gather down the front. There was about, probably about, about a hundred of them. And they were shouting and screaming and causing trouble at the Albert Hall. And then I saw one of them, it was about, probably about five or six rows back, I just saw him do that, and he just saw his hand do that. That's about as far as you can see when you're on stage. And didn't know what had happened, and I'm singing away. We were doing, we thought we'd do summertime blues to try and, you know, make peace with them. And all of a sudden, I felt this warm feeling down my face, and I put my hand up. My hand's covered in blood. And I did, my, some, somehow or the other, I'd been cut in my eyebrow. And I looked down on the stage, and there was on the stage was an old-fashioned penny, which was about that big, copper, and they clipped the sides of it with, so that the sides were sharp. And that's what he'd thrown at me. But I saw it, <laughs> and he was stuck in the middle of this hundred tents, all shouting and screaming. And he, <laughs> so I've gone. <laughs> 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 and the look on his face when he suddenly realised that um, he had nowhere to go. <laughs> and it went off a good shot. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we just finish it there. Please put your hands together for the one and only.